Hello, and thank you for joining us for COBA Conversations. My name is Harper. I'm a senior marketing and physics major, as well as a College of Business student ambassador. We have all seen our social media channels filled with imagery and opinions about the Black Lives Matter movement following the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many more. Today, we invited Dr. Carolyn Messiah to share her thoughts on the impact social media is having on this conversation. Dr. Messiah is the Associate Chair and a Professor in the Department of Marketing. We are so glad to have you here today, Dr. Messiah. Thank you for having me, especially now where we're having such a key conversation, so thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Dr. Messiah's research is focused on the relationship between consumers and brands through marketing and social media. Dr. Messiah, I have to ask, what are some of the positive and negative outcomes you've seen on social media about the Black Lives Matter movement? I'll start answering that with a little bit of, of prerequisite uh, conversation about brands and consumers' relationship with brands. I think uh, some companies understand this and some companies don't. And that's that for a brand, it really becomes a, its own entity. It has its own identity. And that's how consumers relate with companies is through their brands. Uh, why do I say that? Anytime you're giving a message through social media uh, or traditional media as well, but even more so through social media, there are three T's I like to say. Usually I'm the four P's woman, but I'm going to go with three T's today, okay? The timing of the message, the tone of the message, and what's going to be the task that follows that message. So let me just talk briefly about all three of those. The timing. Uh, what I've seen when I've, when I've been watching uh, what's going on with the um, discussion around uh, racial inequality and then the involvement of companies and their brands in that conversation. Uh, you look at uh, two companies that stepped out quite quickly, and it's good because these two companies have, have really had, quite, had a great deal of success in the African-American market, and that's Nike and Adidas. Uh, Nike, being known for Just Do It, uh, came out almost immediately with this just amazing social media presence uh, for once, Just Do It. Immediately, their major competitor, and that's key, their major, one of their major competitors, Adidas, came up with an ad that answered to that, uh, retweeted Nike's social ad, and then answered to that. So their timing was great because they didn't wait for permission or wait to test the waters. They, they took what seemed like genuine passion and stepped forward. Um, they have first mover advantage. You know, we learn about Porter's five forces, and, and in that particular case, they have the first mover advantage. Where I've seen uh, some failure right now, if you look on Twitter and you look at the, you look for the um, top 100 global brands, there are 26 of those brands who are still to this day silent about Black Lives Matter. They, when their timing comes around, I'm going to say when, I'm going to hope on when and not if. When their timing comes around, they're going to have to answer to why they moved not second, third, fourth, but so far down in, in answering. So that's a, a major misstep or failure. So that's timing. And then there's tone. Um, wow, so June 19th. <laughs> June 19th is, is a major holiday for African Americans here in the United States. It's what we consider to be the official end of slavery. That's because June 19th, 1865 is when the last enslaved people here in the United States in Galveston, Texas, were finally informed by Union soldiers who entered the city that they were indeed free. Snapchat. <laughs> On June 19th, they decided to put a filter up that had a chain around your neck. And if you smile, the chain went free. I, I, <laughs> I have no words. So obviously the tone then, um, not having it be controversial, not explaining why, but, but just addressing human equality. Um, so last but not least, task, and I'm going to circle back around to, to Nike. Nike had the right timing. The tone of their, for once, just do it ad was great. 
and they're really putting their money, they're following up with task action. Uh, I think where you'll also see companies fail is even of those global brands who have had a social media presence and have come forth with a Black Lives Matter message, if there's no follow-up action, consumers will see that as well. Uh, particularly the African-American consumers, they'll see that. So all three have to be there, the right timing, the right tone, and the right task afterwards. It's interesting that you mentioned Nike because Nike was Nike and Adidas were two of the very first brands that I yes. saw on mm-hmm. social media. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So kind of related, um, a few weeks ago, there was a social media campaign called Blackout Tuesday. The idea was that people and brands would post a black square to show support for listening and for learning. The campaign led to increased awareness for sharing black platforms, such as black owned businesses, donating to organizations and resources with which to learn more. It can often be confusing to find these appropriate ways to show your support without virtue signaling or, you know, on the other hand, offending someone. So how should someone handle these sensitive topics like these on social media? I'm, I'm going to tell you a little story about a major industry, okay, and a major brand. And this will answer directly to how someone or how a company should handle uh, this uncomfortable conversation. In the 1920s here in the United States, uh, the sale of alcohol was prohibited. So it became known as the prohibition period. Anytime we make anything illegal here in the United States, then a black market will, will start to occur. Okay, so throughout the 1920s, um, and particularly through the South, the Appalachian Mountain um, area, uh, there were individuals who worked at night to hide their their, um, illegal alcohol business. Um, So they worked by the light of the moon, or rather moonshine, okay? Um, And then what they needed was, is they needed to be able to get their items past police, and to their consumers all throughout the country. And so they found individuals who were able to drive really fast and evade police, but also drive cars that looked very standard or stock, if you will, stock cars, okay? But then the 1930s occurred and prohibition was ended. And all of a sudden you have all these drivers that can drive really fast, have really fast cars, they've souped them up, what do we do? Well, a family named the France family out of Daytona Beach, Florida, said, let's get together and let's race. Um, And they did. And February 15th, 1948 was the first NASCAR race, the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing at Daytona Beach. Friends, family members would come and see these drivers race. Why did I tell you that story? Because then you begin to, believe, to understand the history of NASCAR, the region where it grew up, and so then the, the very tight relationship entrenched with the, the symbols of the Confederacy. I'm going to flash forward to when I was a teenager. I grew up in Delaware, not too far from the Dover Speedway. My dad was a super fan of Richard Petty, king of NASCAR, number 43, okay? Um, We were not, we were economically challenged. That's the politically correct way to say we were poor, okay? But one day he got passes for us to go to a NASCAR race. And we pulled up into the parking lot and we're all excited. Oh my gosh, we're gonna see Richard Petty. This is amazing. And the amount of Confederate symbols we saw, My father grew up in pre-civil rights era of Florida. And he said, no, we can't stay. This is not safe. We cannot stay. Okay. So to answer what a company can do, put your money where your mouth is. I literally almost fell out of my seat last week when NASCAR announced the banning of the Confederate symbol at their races. And even now, thinking back to my father, not feeling safe to go, um, saying you want to be an ally and taking a major step, which really 
that's a major financial commitment for NASCAR to make, particularly given where the birth of their industry, where the birth of that brand came from. Not only saying that you want to be an ally, but you want to listen and you want to make action. And they could say, well, wait until we have more African-American racers. They only have one full-time African-American racer in NASCAR now, Bubba Watson. Uh, they could say, well, wait until it's more diverse. But hopefully by making those steps, they'll make it more diverse. That's what you can do, is actually invest in the thought. Yeah. NASCAR, um, until recently, I had heard, was like a, a brand that was dying, but now it's all over the news and people are talking about that they're more accepting of this community. And yeah, I was blown away by their activity and that they marched behind Bubba Wallace. Like, that's what a brand should do. Um, I have to admit, I, I saw that video and um, I mean, even now that just brings me to tears and I... I I, my father has never, as much of a NASCAR fan as he is, he's never gone to a NASCAR race. And I pray as soon as we're able to um, um, get past this pandemic because he's at high risk uh, that I'm able to take him. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, sort of as a follow-up, we've seen a lot of brands and companies post in support of Black Lives Matter and even take it a step further by donating to organizations, updating their company policies, and publicly saying that they will commit to doing better in the future. So my next question is really in two parts. First, why are these companies being so direct with standing up in support of Black Lives Matter? They're mentioning the names, they're mentioning the actual movement, Black Lives Matter. So what's different this time? And then second, how should brands respond when they receive this negative backlash and when consumers question their responses? First, why we see companies um, reacting now more than ever before. Uh, in 2003, the U.S. Census, um, and that's 17 years ago now, uh, the U.S. Census predicted that, that by 2050, Caucasians will no longer be the minority in the United States. It means we're increasing in diversity literally on a yearly basis. Um, we're now at 2020, so 2050 is a whole lot more closer than it was in 2003. It's a reality very difficult to stand by and be passive about. Two, um, unlike even what we saw with the Michael Brown riots when Michael Brown was killed in um, um, St. Louis, um, we have the spread of this, it's viral, we have a spread on social media, in real life, in conversation about these issues. Um, the more you stand silent, both as an individual and as a company, you speak volumes. Silence speaks volumes. And as I said before, you don't want to be the second, third, fourth mover advantage on what's right. Right? Um, what do you do when you have a negative backlash? I'm going to use the NFL as an example. Um, they were wrong. They got it wrong with Colin Kaepernick. They got it wrong. Um, many people didn't quite understand uh, what was going on there. And, and I speak as a, a veteran of the Army. I, I understood and supported. I support my flag, but I understood what he did um, and what he, what he was trying to do in the most peaceful of manner. Um, and the NFL got it wrong and did not support him in that. Now, flash forward to now, um, after what's happened with George Floyd and then the following um, protests, um, and then having the um, uh, players, such a large percentage of the players in the NFL or African American, um, ask, what, what next? What are you going to do? And then having uh, the commissioner of the NFL want to apologize. And I think if it's, if you have the negative backlash, apologize. Um, the same way in gender relations, we, we hope that men will not mansplain things. Um, we need to come up with some phrase that's similar here with racial equality. Don't try to explain <laughs> to me. Apologize. Um, 
admit that you are, you maybe didn't see the whole picture, uh, that you didn't understand. Um, and then do something. So timing, tone, but where companies fall, where brands fall, task. But first and foremost, apologize. At least, thank goodness, with the Snapchat incident, um, June 19th, uh, they didn't try to explain why they did that. They immediately apologized and, and, and pulled it. Uh, but ex ex apologize, apologize first, and then take action. So. Those are all like fantastic points. And hopefully like with that sort of activity, we can move forward. Um, a lot of our students and alumni, they manage brands or work for companies with social media. And yeah, this is excellent advice for them to implement when they do something incorrectly. So our next question is related to diversity in the office. It's not uncommon that a workplace has many employees from a variety of backgrounds, but when you're looking at their senior leadership, their C-suite, it's a lot less diverse. So, you know, can you tell us, should companies and brands make their executive positions more diverse? And if so, where do they start this process? So first, a resounding yes, more diversity is needed. And, and I'm going to take an opportunity to tell you another fail story. Uh, but a company that is also successful as well, and that's Dove. Um, Dove is one of the major global brands of Unilever. Uh, Unilever, world's second largest producer of consumer packaged goods right behind Procter & Gamble. 2017, <laughs> May of 2017, they introduced uh, new product containers. And their thought was is that they would introduce, and this was a product, a Dove body wash that was targeted to females. And they thought, okay, we know how to differentiate or target the same product, but to different females. We'll do it by sizes and shapes. And so they said women would feel more comfortable buying a container that is their size or shape. Now, um, Harper, you and I have stood um, side beside each other and we're probably about the same height. But I'll admit, I'm a bit more rounder than you. So our containers would look a little different, but it'd be the same thing. Someone actually thought that was smart. <laughs> the minute they released that, that packaging, of course, they had backlash from it. And I thought, wow, is there not a woman sitting at that table to say, maybe we shouldn't do this. The same year, October 2017, uh, Dove introduced an ad where it was about body wash again. An African-American woman used the body wash and she turned white. So apparently then the black woman was dirty and the white woman was clean. I, I, I once again, <laughs> why could those things happen? Because you don't have diversity at the table, at the deciding table. Now, you know that Dove does excellent advertising. I actually had to give them a high, virtual high five. Um, they released a COVID ad and it, it talked about beauty underneath the mask that we're all wearing. And I thought, good on you, Dove, you got one right. Fortunately, it didn't have anything to do with diversity, so it didn't speak to a weakness they have. We need to have diversity at the front table. Uh, I went through all three of my degrees, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, never once having an African-American professor. All three were at very large state schools, very large state schools, okay? Now, why do I say that? Then you have companies that truly put their money where their mouth is, and, and the company I'm thinking about is KPMG, the um, consulting firm. And to, in 1994, um, under the, the guidance and support of a just amazing man, Bernie Milano, um, in 1994, uh, they decided, KPMG decided that the people they were hiring from college were not being exposed to enough diversity and leadership at the front of the classroom. And they said, how can we change this? And they said, well, let's populate the front of the classroom with diversity. And they created in 1994, just celebrated 25 years in 1999, they created a program called the PhD Project. 
and its main goal is to recruit African American, Native American, and Hispanic individuals for PhD programs in business. So that then those students then that are, that are um, motivated to pursue their PhD then become the front of the classroom that everyone gets to be exposed to. I'm a product of the PhD project. And that's a company that sees not the most immediate, not the most immediate effect or result from their actions. They're reaching far down the supply chain to the front of the classroom in order to then hope that that exposure to diversity ripples forth to the students so that then when they come to recruit and other businesses come to recruit, they will experience the positivity of having diversity. I'll finish up when talking about diversity and how it matters and why it should matter. You look at Nike, once again, I think amazing company, amazing brand. And they're just representative, unfortunately, are many global, top global brands. But particularly Nike, because when you look at their product and their brand, the most growth that they've had has been with um, the African American community, which then um, that, that brand cachet that started in the African, community, African American community then spread to other communities. And then also when you look at the number of athletes that, are their, that they sponsor and that are their spokespeople, large amount of African Americans. When you look at Nike's um, VPs, 10% are African American, 10%. And I don't say that to discount Nike because sadly, that's a large number. That's a large number. I guarantee if, if companies like Dove, um, brands like Dove populate their, v, their VP or their C-suite with more diversity, both racial and gender, um, you probably wouldn't see the missteps that, that they have had. Uh, it's just so important. I can guarantee you as a professor, like with as many students that you've had come through your class, you've, somebody has looked at you and seen that they can be successful. Um, and I never, I never thought about that before. Like somebody could have gone through your marketing class and looked at you and said, I can be a marketing VP, you know, look at how much of a badass this woman is, you know? Um, and I've had like, students come to say that to me. Uh, and that's an amazing and humbling thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are remarkable, I have to say. Oh, thank um, you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, but for our last question, so how can somebody be an ally uh, or show their support through social media and other channels? It's, it's kind of a difficult thing to navigate sometimes. As a professor, I'll say the best student of any subject is a student who admits their lack of knowledge. That's the beginning of any learning. That's the beginning of the most effective learning is the lack of knowledge. I would much rather someone start a conversation about racial inequality with, I do not know much. Great, I can take it from there. Uh, so, whether it's an individual or whether it's a brand, uh, whether it's a company, uh, starting with, we don't know everything, but we're here to listen. We're here to support and support by words, support by action, support by investment. Um, but the best student in any subject starts with understanding they don't know. That's why they're a student. Dr. Messiah, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions and having this conversation is so, so important. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, it brings together so many issues and topics and subject matters that are, that are my passion. So thank you for having me.